We make movies film geeks podcast episode number 104. Welcome to the We Make Movies podcast, making the world a better place one film at a time. And now, here are your hosts, three aspiring sellouts, Chad, Michelle, and Garrett. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the We Make Movies Film Geeks podcast, podcast about it, all about how to get your movie made, how to get it seen by other people, and how to get it awesome. I'm going to let Chad handle the uh, intro and the community news just while I take care of one quick thing. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't know that was going to happen. If you, uh, if you are watching this, please feel free to live tweet us. Uh, if you use the hashtag we make movies, we will be able to see it and we will re- be able to respond. Um, we uh, might be, I'm not sure where he is, but uh, I, I hope everything with Garrett is okay. Um, we, uh, this is where we, I don't know. So I guess we'll just probably <laughs> talk. So I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know if that came through on the podcast or not, but like right as the music started right as the music started my youngest son decided to throw himself down on the floor outside of my office and start crying so that oh no i couldn't hear anything he's he's fine megan ran and just scooped him right up and everything's good i just needed to hope it's okay i heard nothing he's fine fine. your mic is amazing yeah yeah so uh anyway there there you go anyway i made a i made a real mess of it so uh (laughs) completely took me off guard um (laughs) fine um uh let's just jump right into the main topics for the week sounds good sounds good so uh sundance a uh, little sundance roundup it was a really interesting sundance uh i wasn't there i'm not i'm not uh saying from personal experience but uh re- reading about it checking it out apparently there were a couple of really really massive deals yeah. uh, that were made at sundance this year fox searchlight uh forked over 15, uh, sorry, $17.5 million for Birth of a Nation, um, which actually looks pretty amazing. Uh, And then Amazon paid $10 million for Manchester by the Sea, which has uh, Casey Affleck in it. Uh, Two two pretty relatively small indie films. I mean, Birth of a Nation, maybe not so small, uh, that brought in like a record-breaking money from Sundance. I mean, Birth of a Nation is the largest Sundance ever, right? I believe so. Yeah, I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Um, however, the traditional distributors could not really compete uh, with the, the real big players, the guys who are offering a lot of money for a variety of things are Amazon and Netflix. And they're, you know, the traditional distributors are coming in and they're just getting completely wiped out. I mean, a lot of the sales agents, because they see the big money that's being put on the table are like holding out for really high, high amounts of money. So there's, again, sort of a record breaking number of films that, that have left uh, the festival without being bought. So it's a, it's a really interesting, uh, festival. I'm, I'm really curious how it will continue in the future. Um, is, you know, now that there's apparently even Costco is getting into VOD services. So it's going to be way, 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 way. What? Yeah. Apparently, apparently Costco is, uh, getting into distribution as well. I mean, it's really, this is the first time ever I've heard about it, but apparently, you know, it's getting it's getting really interesting. The, the The field is is getting really bizarre in a sense. I mean, the indie film world is has completely transformed, and we just have to like face those facts. I mean, Miramax is uh, and the Weinstein Company. You know, they're they. It doesn't sound like they're you know they're able to compete. Even they are able to compete with Netflix and Amazon, and and so it's it's going to be really interesting. I don't know if Costco actually bought anything, but they are. You know they're they're teasing it. They're talking about how they're and of course, uh, uh, what do you call Overstock.com had announced it like a year and a half ago that they were going to go live, and I haven't heard anything yet. So right. you know who knows what's it's it's going to be. You know it's interesting that I was just talking about this last week. You know and and I hadn't even heard any of these things. And then as soon as I you know read this Variety article, which by the way I will of, of course include uh, in the show notes. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, like I, I, uh, I, I did not think that it was going to kind of happen this this quickly, but 
I mean, uh, Overstock.com, here, here, here's one thing that kind of confuses me. Like, I, I, I get that more distributors are trying to get into it. Overstock.com is a website-based business. They're an internet business. They have a yeah. website. The website is Overstock.com. Yeah. Okay, so you go there to buy things. How is Costco going to distribute? Like, I, I bet, know. I imagine they have a website, but... Yeah, but maybe they'll have sort of a, a red box type situation. You know, I don't know. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. You know, it's... I don't know. It sounds really interesting, but I mean, it's uh, anyway. We'll we'll see what happens. It's it's really. I I'm so curious. It's times are it's changing the wild so fucking quickly. West. Yeah, yeah. Oh absolutely. my god. I mean, it's mostly you see most of this happening with series, though. You know right. what I mean? That's why I'm a little bit surprised that some of this is is it's spilling over into the film world. But I guess it makes sense. You know, content is is really is king. You know. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I want to. I, I want to start seeing how these things roll out and see how it sort of. See, I I bet you just like there was for iTunes, there's going to start being like facilitators that can get you to all these places. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like distributors yeah. who can get your stuff distributed to Costco, Co Costco, and oh, whatever. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, I mean, everybody and his mom's getting into it. I mean, on, at yeah. some level. I mean, Sheraton. Uh, it's uh, was it Sheraton or Hill? I can't remember which which uh, studio it was. But I mean, they're making their own movies too, right? I mean, it's everybody's getting into it. Crazy. All right. Well, um, that's that's super super uh, interesting. I will get on to a, a slightly more geeky subject. So everyone who uh, listens regularly knows how much I like Marvel and that I like them a lot more than DC. What? I know, uh -huh. right? It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and I, I, not only do I like the films better, but like the culture surrounding the film seems better too. And I was thinking really hard about this this week. I love how Marvel manages their trailers and their marketing, right? Because mm -hmm. this is why I feel like they listen to the internet. They know they are paying attention to what we like and what we don't like. So when, uh, when Marvel or DC does something, and all of the YouTube channels that review geek movies, they all complain about it. I feel like Marvel listens because on their trailers, they don't, they don't show you literally everything that happens in the movie, unlike DC. Like, DC in the Batman versus Superman trailers revealed that Doomsday yeah. is going to be in the movie. Yeah. Like... At, at, uh, that's huge like we thought okay this is going to be batman versus superman and if you're smart you're like okay by the end of the film they're going to team up because there's going to be some greater threat but we have no idea it was going to be doomsday and then they just put him in the trailer and it's like oh well that's how that's going to resolve so <laughs> we're just going to watch the movie and we're yeah, going to watch all the, the whole film the yeah. entire film <laughs> the, whole the whole film whole thing. <laughs> Uh, and then yeah. every single scene is in the Suicide Squad trailer, like all of them. Like you get to see the, <laughs> you see the katana taking the souls, and you see Joker and Harley and everybody, and just uh. But Marvel, meanwhile, like take Civil War, the Civil War trailers. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's some fighting shots. They and, and like they don't lay out the entire plot for you. Right. They just give you the premise. Hey, you know all the superheroes? They're all just going to be punching the shit out of each other. That's mm -hmm. what's happening. And you're like, yes. Sign me up. Ant Man was the was the most recent film, uh, I think, and it like it basically did the same thing. It's Ant Man. He's an ant. He's a man. It's funny. It's cool. We had no idea that Yellow Jacket had stolen the suit from Hank Pym and then was using it and da 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 da. Like we knew Hank Pym wanted him to steal something, but that was it. They didn't lay out like every single beat and then the huge turnaround that was going to happen in the third act to, to do the thing it's premise doesn't that look cool awesome now ant-man was the most recent by the way just confirmed yes thank you yes um and this doesn't mean that like dc movies aren't going to keep making money like yes people are going to show up for batman versus superman and suicide squad but like to me marvel is just a more enjoyable experience overall from the films to all of the marketing and the everything that surrounds them and now i will strap on my helmet and dive in my foxhole before the dc fanboys come and kill me <laughs> dr they're, they're strange, all wrong. Dr. strange, strange is strange. coming oh, this my, year oh my, god. oh my god oh my god oh my god Ooh. i can't wait <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna move on if that's okay yeah i'm just gonna okay. sit here and enjoy this for a <laughs> cumberbatch are you cumberbatching i am cumberbatching <laughs> All over your Cumberbatch? 
all uh, over my <laughs> bender snatch. <laughs> okay, so uh, Louis C.K. I got a really cool email from him. It was very personal. I think he was just emailing me. Now yeah. he uh, he I I'm no joke. I got an email from Louis C.K. yesterday. He emailed everybody on his email list. I'm sure, telling me about a brand new series, the first episode of a brand new series uh, called Horace Shoot. I probably should have written this down. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. <laughs> Horace and something. It's with him and Steve Buscemi. It's got Alan Alda plays their super racist dad. Um, I uh, Horace and Pete. Horace and, say again, Horace and Pete? Horace and Pete. Okay, excellent, yes. And uh, of course, I downloaded it immediately. I didn't have time to watch it, but I bought it, downloaded it. You could buy it for $5, the first episode of Horace and Pete. I don't know how many episodes it's going to have, but um, I started to watch it. I just didn't have time. I, I As soon as you know, he started taking the chairs. He, ru he runs a bar with his, I guess, his brother, uh, who I assume Steve Buscemi played, since Alan Alda plays their dad. Uh, and it looks really, I mean, think about Louis C.K., that I absolutely love, and I've talked about this forever. As an indie filmmaker, he is my freaking hero because the guy is the 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 king of independent content creators. You know, yeah. uh, as you know, he put out that uh, live at the at the Beacon, the, the theater thing that he did. I guess probably a couple of years now. This is when we first started doing the show, and, and he he put it uh, online. Did the same thing. Put his own money. But uh, he said he's like a couple hundred thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars, something like that. Right. He put his own money into the actual filming of it, rented the space, sold tickets, and then you know shot it and and then put it up uh, on his website for five dollars a download. And he made so much money in such a short amount of time. Then it like hit the news, and right. he uh, and he decided to give a bunch of it to uh to charity, which he did. Um, and it was he was anyway. I love this guy. I think that. You know what he does, is, at least as far as I'm concerned, is, is is a real inspiration to indie filmmakers. He proves that if you have an audience, which he does, and it took him obviously time to get there. He, you know, and he, I, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, but he writes, directs, uh, edits all of the episodes. I think he directs every, but I know he edits all the episodes of his uh, FX show, Louis, which he's by the way he's taken a break from for a bit, so I assume so he can do Horace and Pete. Uh, so anyway, I think he's awesome. Uh, check it out. I can't, I'll, I'll probably check it out by the time we do this next time and, and maybe we'll talk about it. I don't know, but I'm sure it's just the fact that he's doing it. Oh, quick little side note. Everything about, uh, the interaction with his, uh, website is awesome and hilarious. And it sounds like you're talking just like, just to Louis CK. Like for instance, <laughs> I need to do a password reset. I don't know if I ever had an account. I must have, but I forgot the password. So it was like, oh, you forgot the password, stupid. It was like, <laughs> it was, everything was like stupid. Oh, and like uh, his, you know, you can decide whether you want more emails at the bo very bottom of the email. It was like, if uh, you had a choice to, but you had to click on the thing that said, don't send any, don't send me any more emails, you fat idiot. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I just love the guy. I think he's he's fantastic, and I love what he's doing. I think he's an inspiration to all uh, indie filmmakers. I think he highlight. I think Louis C.K. highlights something that's really important. That like I have never met a filmmaker who actually thinks about this a lot. I, I just like me personally. I, I know they're out there. I mean, he is one, right? But an email list is like oh, the God. most powerful oh, God. tool Only. ever. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. It is. If you have people, if you and particularly if you are good to it. Right. Like if you spam it, there's no word, there's no quicker way to get to turn fans into into haters. Yeah. But if you're good to it and you're true to your brand and you're authentic and you are you, you know what I mean? You are this is everything about that about that uh, interaction. It's just like Louis CK. It's like feeling like I have a personal interaction with Louis. You can tell it's not a, you know, uh, the guy is very hands-on with his right. stuff. You know, maybe he has somebody who who handles his Twitter account. I don't know. All I know is that whoever's doing it, if he does have somebody, it feels like you're talking just to him. It feels it it, it sounds exactly like him. You know what I mean? And that's I, I totally agree. That's yeah. 100%. I th I, th I think something more people should do is figure out how to grow an email list as a filmmaker because that's that's like how do you even do that? 
You know, yeah. how do you get those email addresses? Well, if you can figure that out and if you can get an email list of, you know, like a few thousand, 10,000, 20,000 people, and then you produce a film that you can actually sell some way, self-distribute on your site or whatever. Yeah. Hello, yeah. that's your living as a filmmaker. Like but that's got to be a legit, it's got to be a legit email address. It has to right. be people because the thing is, is if you use, if you just grab an email list, if you buy an email list, oh, God, you're going to get no. You're gonna get blacklisted so fast, and it's yeah. not like you know Google, Gmail and stuff like that. These these uh, services that send these emails and they right. collect these emails and give it to their own you know customers. The 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 what do you call it? The uh, the threshold for mm -hmm. getting labeled as spam is not high. It's right. like three percent. If three yeah. percent of the people that you email call you spam, and so if you buy an email list. You're going to get, I mean, probably 50% of the people are going to be, you got to get one. You got to get one legit. It was hilarious. A buddy of mine was working for some big company. I can't remember the name of the company, but it was like a big company. It was like somebody, like a big brand and they had screwed up. They had bought email lists and had been, and they were blackballed. Yeah. Uh, this big company. And it's like, you can't, if you're a big company like that and you're blackballed, it takes, it costs you so much money to fix it. Right. Because you're not going to be able to, let's say you're like the LA Times. It's not like you can change, oh, instead of latimes.com, we're suddenly going to be LA Times paper. No, you're going to, you're stuck with latimes.com because right. you're LA, you know, so it's, it, you got to, again, I think my friend did not work for LA Times. I was just using that as a complete example. Uh, ooh, that looks delicious. He's it drinking is delicious. Newcastle. One this broadcast not brought to you by Newcastle, but <laughs> if they want to give us money, <laughs> feel free. They just why would they give it to us? You just gave them free advertising. I well, I might not give them any more free advertising <laughs> unless it's not free anymore. <laughs> yeah, like like get people to sign up organically. Yes. Do a double opt-in so that after they sign up, it's an it, you, the first email is you're sure you want to be on the list yeah, and then right, they say yeah. yes. And then like d you know, email them fairly regularly. If they sign up and your first email is 6 months later and it's like Hey, I have some new thing you can buy. It's like they're gonna be like, "Fuck you!" Unless but, uh, they're huge. Unless you're Louis C.K. I unless mean, unless you're Louis C.K. Yeah. yeah, of course. Because I get an email from him only once every blue blue moon because it's only every once he's released something, right. which is pr pretty rare. But it's freaking Louis C.K. You know what I yeah. mean? It's you know. Yeah, I have a whole thing where like the my my servant like I've I, I've written a bunch of emails that are like after after they opt in, then it's like. Here's an email about like here here's here's why I got started writing and why this is the like this was the first book that I wrote and then a few more and like in those there's like hey and by the way if you uh if you ha haven't read this book yet um if you click on this link you can get it for 50% off and like cool stuff like that so and then I also maintain it I maintain so like if people never open never read never da 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 da, da I just I just brush them off the list and everything yeah. so if you can get a list like that like dude I mean, when I put out a book, like that's how I make a fucking living is off of my email list. When I'm putting out movies and I can just email people, hey, you remember that book that you read and you like and you've been like following the series for a while? I just made it into a movie. Holy shit. That's going to be that's so powerful. So. It's I mean, it's really interesting. People I don't think really realize how much uh sort of administration goes into being an independent artist it really yeah. you have to you have to understand spreadsheets you have to understand these various different things if that doesn't sound enjoyable to you i'm sorry you know what i mean In, unless you're famous and you have people who manage all that sh all these for you you're gonna have to do it yourself but it's really not it's not a lot of work it's and it's really once you get the hang of it it's actually pretty interesting and um by the way just a quick little side note as as i was looking for ant-man uh, to see if it was the most recent. I noticed that this year, and it looks like many of the years past, there have only been, there have been two films per year, uh, two of the Marvel films. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, and in fact, there was nothing 2009, and there was only one 2010. So it's been basically, it's been building up to two films per year. Uh, but starting next year, they move into three films per year. I 2017, know. 2018, Ooh. 2019, three films, each of those. Th that's going to be crazy. At some point, Star Wars is going to do the same thing. I'm talking about that more in my next segment, though. So let me just let me just jump on into that. Do it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the the first part of this doesn't warrant its own segment. So I decided to branch it off. But but um, I, I, I what Colin Trevorrow is going to direct Star Wars Episode Nine. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Colin Trevorrow directed Jurassic World, which, you know, 
like, I mean, <laughs> Jurassic, like, okay, Jurassic World wasn't. Uh, what mm. else is he directed? I don't know. I just know that he directed Jurassic World. So that's like first thing on my mind is like, yeah. that's what he's doing these days. He's doing movies like Jurassic World. Like, I'm glad the Jurassic Park franchise is back. And this wasn't as bad as like Jurassic Park 2 or 3, but it was not great. And there was a whole lot of things that were annoying. And it was a lot of spectacle over substance, which is yeah. another thing we talk about on this thing. By the way, Galactic Galaxy tweeted at us, uh, said, I think it's good news for us web series creators on the fringe. I think he was talking about all of our news on Sundance. That's pretty. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that I think that all these uh, developments on more VOD distributors is really good news for a any filmmaker, honestly. Safety um, not guaranteed. Was that a good movie? uh i have no idea what that is how did he go from like documentary then a tv movie called gary under crisis then safety not guaranteed to jurassic world and now one of the star wars movies how did that happen how was the director of tron legacy how was that his first feature film well it wasn't that mick g was that mick g i don't know oh mick g did the tr the terminator movie yeah and he's an advertising guy yeah, so, and, you know and I mean? so was Kaczynski. Uh, Kaczynski is the guy who directed uh, Tron Legacy and then directed right after that um, Oblivion, that Tom Cruise sci-fi movie. Uh -huh. um, those were his first two feature films ever, well, period. I, I thought Oblivion got a bad rap personally. I really enjoyed it. I did too. Movie. I loved it. I didn't yeah. I didn't ever see Tron Legacy, but people were like, yeah, yeah, I liked it. And I think Oblivion did okay in the box too. So it's like it got a bad rap, but whatever. Oh, people, anyway. oh, people liked it after the theaters then. Oh, you I thought it in the did. box. Yeah, no, I thought you meant so. the theater. No, yeah. I didn't know it in the box. Okay, in the box means the theater. Okay, all right. In the box at the box office is what I meant by that. Okay, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, back to Trevoro, right? So he said recently that he wants to shoot footage for Star Wars Episode Nine in actual space, and like, um. <laughs> Like, like, listen, I'm so excited for episode eight. I'm so fucking excited. It's directed by Ryan Johnson, the guy behind Looper, which just, I fucking love that movie. But, but Trevor directed Jurassic World. And so this makes me nervous. And when he says things like, I want to, I want to shoot actual footage in space. Okay. So now that that's being said, and you know the framing of how I started thinking about all this, let me turn this into a discussion about the future of Star Wars films and Marvel films, in it, like for that matter. Everything Disney's doing. I have no doubt, as people say, that the superhero movie bubble will burst, right? Like one day, Marvel will m not be doing as fantastically well as they are. One day, Star Wars, later, after that, one day, Star Wars will go the same way. And some people see that as a bad thing, like that the fact that if they keep making them, there will undoubtedly be bad Star Wars and Marvel films means that they shouldn't do them or shouldn't make so many or or whatever. But to me, I see it like the Bond franchise, like a better version of the Bond franchise. Yes, there are bad Bond movies. Maybe Bond himself as a character could be reworked so that he's like, slightly less antiquated in his in his like in the way that he does things and they are they are improving him right but the franchise goes along and some bad films come out but then they come back around they sort of reset everything they get a new bond and everything and we usually get some more good ones so i don't care if we end up getting bad star wars and and bad marvel films every once in a while we're going to get more of them like Everyone says, and it's true, Disney's going to keep making these until the heat death of the universe. <laughs> so that means we will get awesome, fantastic movies, as well as the bad ones that, that will inevitably find their way into the lineup somewhere. Like, and, and the thing is, is that the Lord of the Rings films or the original Star Wars films or the original Indiana Jones films or the good Bond films, they're not less good because bad films came afterward, right? So that's 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 what I think we should be thinking with on these things. Yes, there will inevitably be bad films if they keep making them. But yes, there will also inevitably be good films as well. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. A really quick note. I just, uh, we got a tweet from uh, Mr. I think I actually can share it. What? No uh, so way. What? Galactic Galaxy. No, I just did a. I just did a screen. Oh, a screen share. Okay. <laughs> Galactic Galaxy, uh, aka Anthony Ferraro. Just I just said, said this, Chad. Oh, you did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning of my segment. But hey, now it's on the screen. <laughs> now it's on the screen. Okay, and now it's not. Uh, so uh, there it was. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Clearly, I was paying attention. I was paying attention. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, I yeah, I I think that I mean what's interesting though, don't forget is we had three really really bad films in the Star Wars trilogy. Right. And that's the thing. I'm yeah. like we've already seen what happens yes. when you have bad films. Later, finally, they make good ones again. I think the thing is that to me it's like time goes on and you can't assume that something's going to stay good. So it's like to me it's not the end of the world and I you know, I think that, to, that that's why like for instance I, I personally respect uh, the people that make it good. You know what I mean? Right. Like that's yeah. why I'm a big fan of Kev, uh, Kevin Feige is that, and I haven't heard bad things about him, which is particularly good because a guy who's got that much, uh, I, and I would argue self like earned mm -hmm. of power in Hollywood mm -hmm. um, has, does such great work consistently. Whereas you see somebody like Zach, uh, Snyder is his name, right? The director who does, who you know, who's in charge of sort of the 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 DC franchise. Mind yeah. you, he's a director. Feige's a producer. Two very different types of people. Um, but it's really, you know, it's just it's it's very interesting to me how one can do such great work consistently, and the other one can do such crappy work, in my opinion, consistently, and people still rave about him. And it's so weird, and he still gets these great jobs, but he's gonna, you know, I, I just think that, to me, all things end, always. Do you know right. what I mean? Eventually they will. All of us will one day die. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the same is true of Actually, our art. No one will here. exist to remember that humanity existed at all. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe, hopefully that won't be the case, but I, I mean, know. eventually the heat death of the universe will ensure that eventually <laughs> no one will exist to remember that humanity existed at all. <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't know. We could get super If you believe the whole heat death of the universe thing. <laughs> well, my point is, is that at least in art, uh, we cannot mourn the things that are not dead yet. We have to right. live in the moment and enjoy the things that are available to us now. That's kind right. of the way I see it. Yeah. What's more heartbreaking to me is, is when something is ruined kind of right off the bat. Like for me, perfect example, Ender's Game. Oh my uh, God. No, but As that can a, be redone. That can be redone. Can, but it was a successful enough movie that I think it will be a while before it is. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? As opposed to like, uh, uh, I don't know, Aragon. Aragon could be redone. It was a huge box office bomb. It was yeah. a... It was a, I mean, it's not the, like the best book ever. It's it not was a good book. <laughs> that, you know, it was a bestseller. You could yeah. remake that and, br and draw out and distill the promise of the story. Cause the story is promising. It's just not necessarily executed. Yeah. The it, I just wish he, way. I just wish he had cut the books down by half. Well, he was them. 19. Let's not forget. What? He was not. He published Aragon when he was 20. He wrote it when he was 19. Well, that's impressive. I know, right? When that's I tell impressive. people that, they're like, oh, well, what? I think it's a lot better now. <laughs> well, I mean, considering. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's like, objectively, it doesn't make it. But what about the other two books? Because they, I mean, they don't get I any mean, better. They were, they, yeah, they were, they, he was, you know, 21, 23. Uh, he wrote them that fast. He wrote them pretty quick. Yeah. Well, he should have, he should needed a better editor because he they're not bad. Yeah. They're not bad. They're just yeah. twice as long as they need to be. Yep. They're so filled with unnecessary shit. Yep. Anyway, so, uh, yeah. And I say this as somebody who loves Lord of the Rings, so. <laughs> oh, dude, but you can't compare them. I mean. You can't. And the unnecessary, see, that's the thing. There's unnecessary, and then there's, like, like, you can put unnecessary stuff into a story if you do it well. And Tolkien yeah. knew how to put stuff in that made you go, I want to know more about that. And then he was like, nope, moving on. Taking the ring to Mordor. We're going on. Yeah, don't you yeah. get to know anymore. And then you're like, ah, as opposed to just dragging on for unnecessary scenes and chapters and pages yeah. and maybe an entire book. And entire storylines that are something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, 
uh, why? You know, it was, you know, anyway, uh, I'm going to move on if that's okay to the yeah, sort of my main topic. Okay. So, uh, if it's been a while since you've watched this, we've changed this, the way we do our main topics instead of, uh, kind of talking about just random stuff that we, that is kind of, we talk more about them <laughs> instead. What we're, we've kind of focused more on things that we are, uh, doing things that we've learned recently, projects that we've been working on, particular lessons that we've, and this isn't necessarily, uh, it, it is sort of a, pro somebody reminded me of this, uh, at a, at a, at a meeting at our workshop this past Wednesday, uh, which was my birthday, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> somebody was talking about this acting teacher that he and another mutual friend, I, he just met, I, he had just met me and he was telling me about how, oh, I know Don and Don and I were in this acting class and he was telling me about how this acting teacher was, uh, she would pull these things and he was talking about her in a, in a way that was kind of. He clearly liked her, but the one thing that this is going to sound like it's completely unrelated, but trust me, it is related. Uh, at least in my head, it is. It just he was talking about how this acting teacher was was she would play games with their actors, and not good games, not like hey, we're going to play a game, but like would mess with their heads, which a lot manipulate of acting them. teachers, yeah, would manipulate them and like talk down to them and be like, oh, you're like he talked about how this one girl came in first class ever and she was like you really shouldn't be an actor you should just give up right now you know like that kind of thing which you know there are some acting uh actors who think that's good i mean there's some artists that think that's good i mean anyone who watched simon cowell on a uh, freaking american uh uh whatever his stupid Idol. show <laughs> that's the one <laughs> uh you know i couldn't watch a single episode never have particularly when he was on the show i couldn't watch the show because it looked it was so bad and i get that the kind of cult of personality that these types of of teachers if if you can call some of them but some of them actually are and they're getting paid a lot of money to teach that kind of cult of personality that they sort of uh generate i can see that 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 excites people you know i can see how that that creates this sort of um scarcity of of praise that people then start to crave you know what i mean and then it's like oh if he likes it blah 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 and then it's just but and then on the other end of the spectrum you have people who just completely hate that and and so they they're just focused on the art itself and they're focused and there's what's interesting is i think that somewhere in between is honestly as bizarre as it might sound as much as i hate that cult of personality i do see that if you just praise everybody that that is, you know what I mean? It's like if all men were rich, all men were poor, you know, uh, uh, and that's the case. You know what I mean? So you need something in between, at least in, as far as I'm concerned, for for art. You need to be sort of uh, legit. Now, how this relates to the story, to the lesson that I've gleaned from this, it's hard for me to explain, but I'll just dive into it. Uh, and if you can kind of figure out how I connected these two, I'll leave it up to you. I, right. I don't. Anyway. So when I first started writing, I uh, started, I went to a, t uh, not writing, writing, I've been writing my whole life, but when I first started to write like screenplays in earnest, so, so only actually about uh, 10 years ago, um, I, start, I went to a ton of like writers conferences and stuff like that. I just really wanted to kind of learn from, from people that were doing, and, and this was probably back in 2005, back to back, I saw two uh, famous writers uh, at the time, uh, Aaron Kruger was one of them. I can't remember who the other one was. Aaron Kruger wrote The Ring. He's written a, written a ton of stuff, and he um, obviously he didn't. It was a Japanese film, but right. he did the, the I think very good adaptation to uh, to the American version. And he said something. And again, this other writer that I heard in 2005 said the same thing. And they said, "Look, if you want to do this, you have to immerse yourself in it. You have to live, breathe." uh writing and films and stuff like that and and Aaron Kruger said something really interesting though he said that your your day job shouldn't necessarily be related to that you need to have a day job that is conducive to writing uh but everything else about your life go to conferences go to these things meet people and um I was thinking about you know I I still have a day job and I'm not ashamed of it I have a very I like my day job but but the other two people in my in my household uh they don't. They don't need them. They are my my brother is a cameraman and a 
uh, technical director. That's his job. You know, it's very, it, he's freelance. My girlfriend's a producer again, freelance. And that's what they're here to do. Now, part of why I've been working my day job for as long is to help them get there. And that was kind of the whole point. That was the plan. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not ashamed of, of what I do, but regardless of the fact that I have a day job, I have been doing just like Aaron Kruger and just like this other writer was saying, immersing myself in art. I have been creating, you know, a, a, a big part of the, we make movies community for a long time. And, uh, and I was just thinking about it the other day when I look back on the amount that I've accomplished, no, I'm not famous. No, I'm not. I haven't given up my day job. I'm not a full-time director, writer, producer, but I've done a ton. I mean, I've done a lot. And if I 10 years ago were to, to, to look here and, and assume that in 10 years I would have done everything that I've, I've done, obviously it's, it's weird. It's skewed. You'd be like, well, I would have hoped I was famous and making major feature films and stuff like that. But right. when, when you break it down, I'm, what I've done like you could break it down year by year between now and then. And it's still, I think, at least for me, I'm proud of what I've done. And I think that this is how it kind of ties into what I was saying before. Um, you don't, you can be focused on the art in a way that is um, truthful and in a way that is, uh, that is, you know, that recognizes those things that you have done and, and you have the ability to be proud of what you've done without, you know, being all pompous about it. You know what I'm saying? And I think that there's a balance in that and that, and, and it's in acting styles and it's in, in, in who you are. But at the end of the day, what you really just need to do is immerse yourself in whatever it is that you do. And if you're watching this and you're, you're brand new, you haven't started. I mean, obviously you probably already know this kind of stuff if you've been doing it for a long time, but if you are brand new, just start to act like you are a writer right now. You don't have to pretend you know, you can be honest with people and say, I'm still learning my craft. I'm still, you know what I mean? That's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. And if people Just make scoff, sure that part of that is actually writing. <laughs> yes. And that is, that is absolutely true. You have to actually be learning your craft. You have to actually be practicing. And even as bad as it, as it seems at first, if you've ever seen the, the, um, uh, what's the guy's name from, from this American life, the, Anyway, he has this thing where he talks about, I've talked about it, it, it before, er, er, Ira Glass. He has this video, Ira Glass, where right. he talks about how your taste is killer now, you know? And it's a fantastic video. If you've not seen that video, you need to watch it now, especially if you're a new artist, because in a nutshell, what he says is that your taste is killer right now. Yeah. Your skills are not there yet. Right. So as soon as you produce something and then you see it, your taste is going to be like, that sucks because your skills can't match your taste yet, but he says, stay at it. And eventually over time, eventually your skills will match your taste. And that's and you only when- get there, Yeah, you only get there by by continuing to exactly. work, to practice and to to continue. And, and you improve every time you look at yeah. something that somebody else is doing and what you're trying to doing and learn from the way that they're doing. Yeah. But don't forget, that is your craft. You cannot, uh, Sorry to, unless you were very lucky, unless you're like, you've bought a lottery ticket or whatever. Uh, you, you honestly just cannot uh, make it by just focusing on the, on this craft. I mean, I'm not saying this hundred percent of the time, obviously there right. are these people that, that, that can and do, but for the most, for the majority of us, we have to focus on our craft, but we also have to focus on the uh, sort of administration parts. We have to stay in touch with people. We have to develop these email lists. We have to develop relationships and we have to stay immersed in this so that we can create our own um, opportunities. Anyway, yeah. this kind of, it kind of, I feel like that meandered, but I hope that that, uh, no, I hope that I think that, I think it's really valuable. And and the the one thing that I'd add on to like the tail end of that mm -hmm. is that once if you don't like that other stuff, if you don't like the amount of like administration and like, <laughs> like the 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 periphery uh the per periphery yeah. the peripheral business things you have to do in addition to your art because you have to create the art and then you have to like business like market it and stuff. Um you are unfortunately almost certainly going to have to do it anyway until you can get to the point where other people can do that for you. Like but even when you do have the people who can do it for you, just to be completely honest with you, 
you know, they're not going to do it as much as you want. They never really are. And they're not necessarily going to do it in the way that you want. You got to recognize that even if you're freaking, uh, you know, George Clooney, I guarantee you he has to pay attention to what his, his agents oh, are doing. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're going to want to make money. And sometimes yeah. he's going to want to make art that's yeah. not necessarily going to make. And so you have to, you have to, you have to pay attention no matter who you are. Oh, for sure. You never, you 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 never just to get, get to like like completely cast it off and 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 yeah. cast it aside. But like right. this week, literally this week, mm-hmm. I hired a video editor and a person to take care of my online marketing, and I am so fucking happy about that's it. Great. Like, that's great. But that's after four years of building a career as a writer where I could actually do that. Yeah, and that like. Like that's the thing. I did all that stuff by myself for four years. Didn't sleep much, and and like, and but if I hadn't done those things, if I'd just written and never done any of the additional stuff that you need to do, then I wouldn't have gotten to the point where I could get other people to do it. So what's crazy yeah. is you did that while also fathering forty-seven children. <laughs> that's three. Just that's for anybody who impressive for anybody who d- d- doesn't know three hundred. And seventeen children, and forty six thousand <laughs> children. Amazing, impressive. Oh, fantastic! All right, so um, I'll get on to to my main topic, which is Why actually it, uh, it's funny. There's a few there's a few echoes in 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 mind that I was thinking of while you were saying, and I will try to remember. Uh, I as I'm going through, I will try to remember those echoes and probably fail miserably. Um. So I've been trying to uh, branch out uh, with my uh, online career, whatever you want to call it. And I'm trying to amp up the level of the stuff that I'm doing with my writing and my filmmaking, more focused on the writing right now, obviously. And I'm trying to make more fun, I don't want to say commercial stuff, but like stuff that's more successful, right? And I also want to do things that are more important. And like right now, you know, YouTube is like a big thing where I can easily do something that's important. Like you, you, like, and when I say important, I mean to one degree issue driven. And you could say that my fantasy books are somewhat issue driven because I've done a lot of things, um, like like creating a war, a fantasy world where like gender politics aren't a thing and racial politics, just as like imagining like what that sort of thing would be like. So you could say, oh, well, that's like an like issue driven, but really, it's it's not. It's not like it's not making a statement. the The story, the 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 story itself, isn't making a statement. If anything, the world is just sort of like accidentally making a statement by existing. But on YouTube, I can just make a video saying whatever, saying something about feminism or or racial inequality or income inequality or or whatever I want to do, and push messages that like you know maybe contain good ideas into culture and whatever. And there's so much of this kind of stuff happening. And there are people who are doing stories and film and TV that, you know, promote diversity in filmmaking and promote good ideas in filmmaking and like speak to a lot of important issues. Things like Orange is the New Black and, um, uh, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue. But then sometimes there's a problem where people who are like privileged try to do something beneficial, but in the process of doing it, talk over or outright ignore the people that they're trying to like help with their message. One of the most blatant examples of this where I'm not even, I I don't even know if they were trying to do the right thing is the film is last year's film, uh, Stonewall, where they took a movie. Yeah. They took a story about a series of riots, um, in the, uh, and, and civil unrest, uh, in the LGBT community. And, uh, but but which was started by people of color and trans women of color and and that and cast it with a bunch of uh, of white guys playing straight white guys playing gay white guys straight white guys playing gay white guys playing gay white guys so it's like that's not <laughs> that's not so helpful but sometimes it's not that like blatantly sort of wrong or whatever or stupid so, or stupid it really really just stupid. <laughs> So one of the reasons that I'm talking about this is that something just happened, uh, or or at least I just became aware of it, with YouTuber uh, Francesca Ramsey, uh, who goes by Cheska Lee on all social media. It's C-H-E-S-C-A-L-E-I-G-H. Um, 
So she had a really unfortunate interaction with Jill Soloway, who is the creator showrunner of uh, the show Transparent. Now that show is about a trans woman who comes out and transitions very, very late in her life. It's an Amazon exclusive show. We've talked about it on the podcast before. And like, that seems great, right? Yay for trans inclusion. Awesome. And it's unfortunately one of those series that each of us, like we've said, before, I don't know if you've watched it, Chad, but we've said before, oh God, I got to watch that. But then like never really get around to it because we have like so much stuff that we could watch and want to watch. But so uh, Francesca Ramsey, Cheska Lee, met her, I was at a conference with her or a meeting or something like that. Uh, I think they might have been on a panel together. And she brought up that, um, that, uh, Soloway treats black people not great. Like they're very stereotypical. Um, they're, uh, like their, their, their portrayal is offensive. And, uh, and she got some, some pretty bad responses. I mean, things like, like straight up, just like angry responses and, and stuff like that. Uh, and then or Jill Soloway did well, Jill Soloway made these responses. Like she replied to her with, angry uh -oh. like that's that's uh -oh. wrong you're wrong and then saying things like i'm not racist i'd totally sleep with a black uh, with a black person <laughs> or like i slept with tons of black people like that sort of thing like uh that's not that's super not okay um just in case you think it's kind of like cool or whatever to say that that's not nope um yeah i mean like like if you want a like the most blatant and obvious um, reason that it's not okay to say that, the 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 fact that like slave owners slept with <laughs> I their was slaves, just thinking that. I like, was just thinking that. So saying that you sleep with <laughs> like it's just it's not a defense no. against your racism. So I just want right. to I just want to just toss that out there, just so that you know that that's not fucking some example of you being a totally awesome person. No. So here's the thing. If you're actually trying to increase representation and be more fair in your filmmaking, or in this case, you know, TV show making, you should spend more time listening than trying to shout down those who have critique about the way you do things. Like people can like art and still be critical about it. I have this uh, blog that I follow on Tumblr who I love. They're called uh, Whovian Feminism. I should, I should say she, because it's just one girl that runs it. And it's reviews of every single Doctor Who episode from a feminist perspective. And she talks all the time on her blog. She, she kind of has to, because people go apeshit at her. They're like, how dare you? Da, 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 da. She loves Doctor Who, loves it to pieces, because she criticizes the way that it's that the show sometimes handles women and other times praises it but because she criticizes it sometimes doesn't mean she doesn't like the show right like especially if something's framed very very fairly and reasonably in in the framework of i love what you're trying to do with this show but i found this part to be problematic right like if you've ever seen cheska lee on youtube or or anywhere really her patience is mind numbing the way like the way that she explains things to people and in the face of people being so moronic like to the point where i would just be like okay you're an idiot and i actually can't continue this conversation she just handles it with total grace and total aplomb and just it's awesome right you need to listen to people like that. Like their critique is not an opportunity to flex your fucking debate skills. Okay. And this breaks, and it, it also breaks down into one of the things that I always, always, always tell people who are new to, we make movies. When we do our script readings, our writer Wednesdays, the audience is invited to critique what they've just heard and seen performed. If you are a filmmaker who has had your piece read, you do yourself no favors by arguing with the audience's opinion, no matter how wrong you think they are. And here's the other thing. You don't have to make the changes that they suggest. You don't have to change anything. But to sit there and tell your audience, whether it's a critique audience hearing your script being read or the audience that actually consumes your completed, fully produced content, 
to sit there and tell them that they're wrong for criticizing anything you do because what you're trying to do is help. That's just really, really short-sighted and it just will not help you uh, make better films in, in the future. If, if you are like, if, if, if your idea or what you're done, what you've done is worth defending, like other segments of your audience will probably leap in to defend it or whatever, which is like what happens to trolls on YouTube channels. Somebody leaps in and says, Oh, this guy's nah, 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 nah. like somebody else is going to jump in and be like, you're a hor horrible, hideous troll, you know? <laughs> so even on trolling comments, it, it just does you no good to do that. Um, to do anything more than just acknowledge that you heard the person. And if somebody's giving you critique from a place of trying to improve your work, you do yourself no favors whatsoever by arguing how they're wrong, especially when it comes to representation and diversity and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I'll get off my soapbox now. I, the one thing I, the, that, that, I mean, that you were talking about that really strikes a chord with me is that regardless of whether it's, you know, uh, particular causes that you have right I, I think it's really important like it's funny because uh i didn't talk about i don't think i've talked about this but i wrote an article did i did i talk about the whole um uh the adam carolla thing on here at all yes oh okay i think i, <clears throat> pretty I sure. might have did i briefly i okay i don't remember if i did or not but it's that is obviously a cause that i feel very strongly about but it's it's something that's right. personal to me because i'm yeah. hawaiian but uh, you probably, I don't know if you read my article. I, I posted an article on my website, but I don't think I actually went into much detail on it here. But yeah. it's, um, that's one thing. But what, but where, what you're, what you're talking about really strikes a chord with me is, is even broader. Uh, oh, funny. I see Aragon on your bookshelf there. All three of them. I see uh, all three yes. of them right there. That's funny. All three of them? <laughs> yeah. I thought there was a fourth one that I was actually missing. But I could be I, wrong. I've only read three, and God help me if there's a fourth because <laughs> <laughs> it was hard getting through. It's like one of those books where it was like I I kind of couldn't stop because I was so invested. But oh my God, how much time I've wasted on this already. Anyway, um, the thing that really bothers me is when people talk about art as if as if it is one thing, one thing right. to all people. That bothers the crap out of me. And then and because. And what's in, what I really dig about our, our community by and large, and yes, some people aren't very good at taking notes, but by and large, uh, we are a group that is, you know, that we come in and we speak to each other respectfully. And even if it's like completely off base, in my opinion, that the manner at which we're speaking is very respectful. And, right. and 90 percent of the time seems from a point of like, I think this will help your peace be better. Now, some people have very political ideas that are not my own, and that's fine. Um, I have very political ideas that are not, you know, my employers, for instance, <laughs> and right. that's that's fine. We have other things that we can that we can come together on, which is great. Um, particularly when apparently they were still editing Adam Carolla, something for Adam Carolla, and I don't know anyone else here that edits, but I think my boss had to teach himself how to edit oh, God. <laughs> because because he knew I wouldn't touch the fucking thing. So um, anyway, uh, I think that that looking at art, understanding that art is is a skill uh, on top of talent is is so vital, and that whenever people are like, "Oh, that movie was was shit," you know what I mean. And I know I, I say that I I believe it, but I'm not saying that oh, it was shit, and if you like it, you're a, you're an idiot. You know what I mean? Like that's stupid. <laughs> art is art. You know what I mean? And I yeah. think just because I think Zack Snyder's a, a freaking ridiculous hack doesn't necessarily mean that I think that that nobody likes is apparently clearly well, it, so in the case of Zack Snyder though I think you're I think you're more <laughs> justified maybe I don't know well I don't I don't I think there is my point is is there is subjective uh points to be made and then there are objective objective points to be made the right. fact of the matter is is I sincerely doubt any of his films will ever ever hit it's sort of especially a series of films will ever hit the, the level of success of, of feige now that is a, the kind of statement that you cannot that is provable you know what yeah. i mean you can look at the actual box office and say that somebody, yeah somebody uh somebody brought up the cool i saw the coolest post the other day i mean cool weird kind of whatever and <laughs> somebody was like i don't get avatar the film and i don't mean that i don't get the film i mean i don't get why it's was so big 
it was so whatever. And like, there was a lot of discussion about it. And people obviously talked about the newness of the 3d and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing. But the person said, name one character from the movie quote, two lines from that film. And like, nobody could do it. I can't do it right now. I looked them up afterwards and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that character. I don't remember them. I don't remember them now. I don't remember the names. I don't remember any lines from that movie. I remember a couple of shots. That's all. And yet until recently, it was the biggest box office film ever. Just blah. Crazy. But that doesn't necessarily, just because you can't, because some movies, a lot of movies nowadays are actually meant to be a spectacle. And so it's supposed to sort of just wash over you and you leave the the theater going like, wow, what happened? It's like a roller coaster ride. You can't quote any lines from a roller coaster ride. Sure, you know but in terms, of, in, terms of, in terms of like standing the test of time, right? Like I was having a conversation with somebody about this the other day. I wrote like a really self-referential script that like tons of like young novelists and filmmakers uh, do this all the time writing a screenplay about a filmmaker writing a screenplay <laughs> right like that whole, that yes. whole thing that uh, everybody that. does early in their early in their career they all I thankfully it. never did thankfully Who? I never did I never oh, did okay good thank you very much I actually still want to produce this script very badly it's got lots of like filmmaking jokes like um the guy who's producing the film um is talking with the dp who has made his shot list and they're walking on the street and this this there it's like a montage of them like like planning the film and so the producer is talking with the with the dp and he's like why is this a crane shot and the guy's like i don't know i thought it would look good as a crane shot no no crane shots i hate crane shots and that is one shot in the montage which is of course a crane shot like you would shoot that as a you know what i mean like shit like that like really cute little things and See, uh, the thing is, I early, early on, somebody yeah. said something to me that I never forgot. Just because it happened to you doesn't mean it's interesting. And right. so <laughs> that that I've taken to that degree that even if you you know filmmaking, you know writing, you know these various different things. So of course you're going to be drawn to write about those kinds of things. But it's right. so easy to tweak it ever so slightly and make that guy like in uh, Thirty Days of Summer. Uh, right. A card writer, a guy who writes greeting. You know what I mean? It's so yeah. easy to just do the tiniest tweak and change it ever yeah. so you know, Absolutely. Because, so th that's why I don't know. I just never have. I've never felt the need to. Well, one thing, any, anyway, the, the reason I, I went into that story about the script at all is that um, there was a thing that there's a whole monologue in, in the script I wrote. There's a whole monologue about this, which is that what makes a film that lasts in people's minds forever and like becomes a cultural icon is uh is what did i call it i called it like the lines that make the movie and it's it's lines that people 40 years later can still quote it's rosebud it's use the force uh star wars i actually mentioned in the script like has like four or five of those and jerry Maguire has a, quite a few show mm. me the money you know you had me at hello uh Oop, you froze. Uh-oh. I don't know if people are watching me now or watching you. One of us froze. <laughs> uh, in case you were watching me and not Garrett. Hello? Did you freeze? Did are I you freeze? back now? You I think I'm back up. now. Okay. okay, you're back. Hello. Sorry. Yeah, and, like, and Jerry Maguire to me is like the perfect example of a film that has remained relevant. Not, not Maybe not relevant, but like... Show me the money. You complete me. Help me help you. We know those lines and we where, we know where they came from. And even like kids today who are like under 20 years old and probably have never seen it, they've heard those lines being used before and they probably use them every once in a while. And yeah, that's, but, but that's, know, yeah, but those, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily, you know, there are witty writers and then there are writers that put people in very specific, like for instance, Harold Pinter is one of my favorite playwrights and David Mamet uh, is, is a guy who follows what he does very closely. And I feel like to some degree, uh, the Coen brothers kind of uh, rip off, not rip off, but they kind of try to emulate uh, a Mamet to, to, to some degree. I don't think that mm. they, they're quite there, but that's sort of a, uh, that's sort of a um, a particular style that is not necessarily really fixated on 
on these catchy, uh, memorable lines because they're focused on being very conversational on it coming. Like if you ever watch Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and if you've ever directed, by the way, you should try as an exercise, just direct a mammoth scene, just a scene, just for your own, you know, edification. edification. In fact, we just started, a new, we started a new night at, we make movies where, uh, it's called on our feet where we're going to allow people to come in and bring in rehearsed stuff, off book stuff. Um, and they can do feedback or not feedback just to kind of give people a sort of a gym, a place to kind of work, uh, work out. That's really cool. Yeah. It's a really should be, so it should be a lot of fun. So you could do that kind of thing. Um, and you could do it for that, but you should definitely do it because it's so rhythm based yeah. and like people are talking over each other and blah, blah. There's no way you're going to be able to get the line. I mean, so, I think they, in the movie there was, there was one coffee is for closers. You know what I mean? Like one of those types of lines. That's but, the thing. But I think, I think it's, I think it's a broader point than just memorable lines themselves. Like I'm a, I'm a dialogue fiend. Like if dialogue's bad, I fucking know it. Like that's mm -hmm. my most common critique at we make movies is like your dialogue could use another pass. And when dialogue's good, I fucking love it. That's why mm -hmm. some of my favorite people are, you know, like Tarantino, like say what you will about his films. He can, he, he's got these scenes where the dialogue is just, oh my God, right? Mm -hmm. But there's other things too. There's, there's, there's other things about movies that have lasted in the, in the fucking zeitgeist and whatever that are not lines, but moments like mm -hmm. filmmaking moments, like scenes or shots or, or, um, or uh, plot twists, you know. I mean, Sixth Sense had had uh, had the the line, you know, "I see dead people," and that was like the line mm -hmm. that, like, you know, everybody remembers and whatever. But it also had the plot twist at the end. There's no mm -hmm. lines associated with that, but you will right. always remember the Sixth Sense as the movie with that twist, right? Yeah, right, right, right. So I think that there's a lot of like, how the fuck did we even get on this well, topic? Uh, we I were don't talking, remember how you were <laughs> you were talking you were talking about. Uh, uh, damn it! What the hell is the name of that film? The the with the blue people and you were talking Smurfs. <laughs> <Your mind? laughs> James Avatar. Cameron. Avatar. Avatar. You're talking about Avatar, and I don't know. I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe Avatar will not sort of last the, you know, the ages. I don't know. I enjoyed it. It. I thought it got again sort of a bad rap. I do. Part of me as a native person thinks that it's a little bit uh, white, white man savior. comes in and saves. Yeah, it's a little white savory, <laughs> but uh, but I enjoyed it and I still, you know, and I don't I, I don't apologize for it. I like it, you know, but I don't know if it was good enough to stand the test of time. It's the kind of film that I enjoyed so much watching that I, I watch it every now and then just because it's a fun spectacle that washes over you. And it's really and you you it transports you. Do you know what I mean? And I think that that is part of why, and especially when times are tough, like when the economy is in crap, you know what right. I mean? That is very, very, very kind of common. When the economy tanks, people go to the movies and yeah. they want to see these big spectacles. And they want to see these big, because it takes them, it pulls them out of their lives. And it's right. only when like the economy is up with, when is when like the drama dramas come in and like the people, you know, the sort of, especially the-, the Remember game. how everything terrible was 10 years ago? <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's that's when those things come back but you know anyway uh i don't know if that answers your question and i don't think and i'm not trying to be sort of an apologist for the movie i just think that there's nothing wrong with enjoying movies that wash over you i mean the oh totally the marvel films are really that they happen to be i think a cut above that you know what i mean like they yeah. they do they, it they're, they they're in the middle and they are yeah. more any of the marvel films on their own would be a movie that would just be forgotten but because that's what exactly. I love about the Marvel films. They're part of a tapestry. Each exactly. film is just a component. And yeah. as a as a as a whole, it's the Marvel universe. And that's just yeah. fucking cool. And He's that's doing on film yeah. what what is really happening right now in TV. You know right. what I mean? And he is sort of the only one who is successful, at least that, that I'm saying. I mean, Lord of the Rings, uh, The Hobbit to some degree, these, you know, they well, spread but that was, out over that was movies. Yeah, that ended though. You know, that's like that's a that's a specific thing. That's why but Marvel, I'm but this yeah. bound this bout of films is supposed to end at the end of 2019. It's he says it's a very specific storyline that's supposed to end at 2019. And then But he said that after that, 
Yeah, that's supposed to be phase three. That's Marvel phase three. And then after that, phase four starts and it's going to be some... I, I fucking hope they do Secret Invasion. Holy shit, that would be so fucking amazing. I don't know if I know Secret Invasion. I oh, I wish... My favorites as a kid was X, were X-Men. I love the X-Men, but I'm not happy about the X-Men, what they're doing with the X-Men series now because they're so off off canon. So. It's true. They're, th- but they are also kind of successful. So hopefully, and, and I hate yeah. to say it this way, but hopefully we're going to have one or two bombs and then, and then Marvel and Fox will reach the same deal on X-Men that Marvel and Sony reached on Spider-Man. I hope so. I hope so. You know, we're seeing Spider-Man in the civil war movie, right? Oh yeah, of course. He's a big <laughs> part. <of Civil> war. <laughs> well, he's not going to be, he's not going to be as big, but in the movie. he is. Oh yeah. yeah. They cut- I mean, they, it, they can't be, bit. yeah, because it's like it's it's supposed to be Captain America's movie, even though it's in like the, yeah. In the previews, it very much is Captain America, right? And uh, Winter Soldier, whatever his name is, Bucky. Which, by the way, isn't he the same guy from? Isn't that the same actor from Star Wars? Poe? You mean po? Oscar Isaac? Po, uh, no, that's that's his, no, not Poe. Okay, all right. No. I, they look. <laughs> it's really hard for me to tell white folks apart. I can't really. <laughs> They look so alike to First me. First of all, Oscar Isaac is Hispanic. I would just like to say that. Um, and but, the other uh, guy is not? Which one is which? Uh, no. The other guy is like, if you look at the two of them, I guess in like, I don't know. Look at Oscar Isaac from Ex Machina. And then look at... Uh, it's <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. he was in Ex Machina. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. you're like, yeah, he's... I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. I really, I know. I really, really want to see it. it. Oh my God. We're, I think we're anyway, starting to really meander here. <laughs> we really are. We should move towards the end of the show. It was a good meander though. I enjoyed every step of the wandering. <laughs> yes. um, so we'll uh, move on to the community news really quick. Uh, as always, we ask that whether you're watching us live on YouTube or whether you're listening to the audio feed afterwards, please pop over to iTunes and give the show a rating. If you don't mind, it helps uh, grow the audience. It helps more cool people find us and it helps uh, everything be more awesome. This week, we are having What's Next, the night where filmmakers uh, bring in projects in various stages of production or post-production, sometimes still pre-production, and uh, ask for uh, your critique and your advice on making them better. It's happening at the Melrose Lightspace, 7600 Mel... Excuse me, 7600 Melrose at Melrose and Curson, second floor. Uh, By the way, uh, Chad, uh, super sorry I didn't get to come out to your birthday bash last week. It's all good. uh, I, it's all good. I heard, I heard you had a good one, Anthony. Uh, by the way, he Anthony uh, t- tweeted a couple other times. I didn't notice it until just now. Uh, he said Charlie Kaufman killed it with adaptation as far as making self fresh for. I don't think the thing about Charlie Kaufman is he can do whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> <laughs> he is kind of a step above everybody else in the world when it comes to this kind of thing. Uh, another thing is, and you should yeah, probably, totally. he played that character. Like I could not tell when he was putting on the character that the character was, Oh, that's Andy Kaufman. <laughs> Never mind. I'm different, sorry. Different guy. And that, he also, uh, tweeted. It's hard uh, for me to tell Kaufman's apart. Chris Pratt, uh, talking about the long road to success. Um, and he included a little, uh, a little post about that on sunny skies.com. So definitely check that out uh, in the Twitter feed. And, um, one thing I think I can hold on. Let me go back to stop screen. Shares. Am I back? Okay, good. So the, uh, are we, sorry, did I jump, did I jump the gun here? Or am I, are we in things to know yet? Please oh no, uh, not quite yet. Uh, so, okay. uh, the last thing that we always like to say in the community news is that we make movies is the only filmmaking community in the world. So far as we know that is supported by its community. And that happens through patreon.com. If you don't know, patreon.com is a fundraising site kind of like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, except instead of one big crowdfunding push, there is a voluntary monthly subscription to artists who you enjoy, who keep creating stuff for everybody for free. And uh, our Patreon uh, account is what enables We Make Movies to put on all of our events, which are free for anybody to attend. So go ahead and check it out at patreon.com slash we make movies. Check out all of the cool awesome stuff you can get for being a member supporter a regular um we've got a few different levels with different levels of you know awesome rewards and also um everything that you uh put in from this point uh 70 cents of every dollar goes into a rolling production fund that actually helps us make the movies that we are creating together as a community and we end finally with things to know 
Chad? So uh, I have a little tease here. There We have two weeks from, well, not actually uh, one week from this upcoming Wednesday. This upcoming Wednesday is what's next. Um, so definitely check that out. I, I know you already said that. Uh, but a week from Wednesday uh, is our regular writer's workshop, and we have an announcement to make. It's a very special announcement. <laughs> We're only gonna make it uh, this one time live. If you are a member, we'll probably be talking about it a little bit on the Facebook uh, channel just now and then. In a nutshell- We'll, we'll definitely send it out to supporters on Patreon, right? Uh, sure. Oh, that's Since, what I'm talking about in the Facebook. Okay, good. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. good, good. Yeah. Just checking. Uh, which is where we do all, uh, for all of our Patreon members, Will. Yes. Anyway, this is the thing, is it's kind of super secret because there's, there's a few different types of, of films that we make. There's the main one is is uh, the stuff that costs the, the money, a big chunk of the money that that you give if you're if you're one of the givers, um, and that is basically uh, paid for, uh, voted on, decided by the community. Then on the other end of the spectrum, and by the way. This doesn't include like commercial work or, or, or other kind of stuff that we're just contracted to do as a production company. That's on top of this. But there's stuff that, that is community-based. Of the community-based uh, content, these are sort of the three types. On the other end of the spectrum, I'm jumping from one to three, and then I'll cut back to two in a second, is stuff that is that we as uh, the board and, and the people who kind of help run the thing, we see certain stuff come through that we think we can find money for. And so we try, we reach out to the individual people. And this is on sort of on a one-on-one -on -one basis and we reach out and we look and we get money, then we produce it as a production company. So that's the other end of the spectrum. So that stuff that, that comes through and, and, it, and we, we think we can find some money for it, we will grab it. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do about merit. I'll just be honest with you, not necessarily. It just means we think we can find an audience for uh, 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 money to help produce it, and we do that. Now, in between is the second part, and that's stuff like the sketch show, where we, uh, where it's somewhere in between, where it's like the audience doesn't necessarily, you guys don't necessarily vote on it, but sometimes you might, like the, like we did with the sketch show, and and that stuff is constantly in flux. Um, there's a project that we're working on right now that is the third type. Uh, so this announcement has to do with that. Uh, so we're opening it up. We have this really, I think, innovative uh, marketing campaign that we're going to be doing for it, and we're inviting you guys to help us out with it if you want. So you, uh, and I think it's really cool. I created it, so obviously I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> can I, or is that okay? Um, but I do. I think it's kind of fun. I have a lot of fun doing those kinds of things where they're really crazy out there kind of campaigns. So this is one of those. Uh, if you want to help out. Well, we're going to talk about it, uh, but it's going to be like Fight Club. You can't really talk about it after you've you've heard after you've witnessed it the first time. All right, last time I swear. <laughs> Why does it, it sounds weird? The second and third time, it got real demonic and dark and shit like it, that. It sound it sounded that way from, from go for me. Thank oh. you very much. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, my thing to know is just uh, a reminder that uh, I released a book this week. Came out on Tuesday. It's called I The Alchemist. You did? Oh, yay! Yeah, I pre, I pre, uh, I pre bought it, so it did arrived. You, uh, in my, did you, I was did you pop it at all? I was in the middle of um, something else. Uh, I'm always very Thank curious God. to hear people's reactions because um, the the first series that I put out, uh, the the Nightblade series, um, a lot of people like read the first book and sort of pigeonholed it as like young adult fantasy, even though there's some, there's some not young adult stuff in there. Not, not like, like, there's like no, like explicit, like no, like there's no porn? explicit sex, sex scenes, oh, I'm uh, not but interested. there's, there's violence. There's no goat porn. I'm not really interested. There there's violence. There's like, um, there's like, like child molestation that's talked oh. about. Like, like this is something that happened to a character and everything. Um, and it's, it, I guess it's hidden behind too many layers of language. Right. So like people are like, oh, well, you know, whatever, it's young adult, but like the, the books get darker and like progressively darker. So I, I don't want people to think of it as young adult. Cause I don't want somebody to like buy their teenager the thing. And then they get a few books in and it's like, whoa. So on this one, it's a the first book in a new series and second scene is a sex scene. It's just like, Hey, not for kids, big fat, not for kids sign, not for kids. <laughs> what do you have against kids? Uh, I just, I have, I also have books that are appropriate for kids. I wanted to write a series that was not appropriate for kids. Uh, I like kids a lot. I have, have 47,000 like kids. 
<laughs> you have so many kids. You've got like a baker's dozen cubed. I have three kids. children. Three <laughs> children for anybody listening. All right. That's going to be it for this week's episode of the We Make Movies Film Geeks podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for the people who are watching live. And thank Welcome you so to much the We Make for- Movies podcast. Long sound file. I do this every time. <laughs> Every thank you, Anthony time. Ferrero. Yes, thank you, Anthony, for the live tweets. We really appreciate it. I'm Garrett Robinson. You can find me at GarrettBRobinson.com. Chad is online at SuperFrico.com. And we'll see you next Sunday afternoon. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.